Hello, welcome to the Oral History Project in Criminology and Criminal Justice. We come to you today from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, on the campus of the University of Pennsylvania. My name is Jay Albanese, and today I have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Frida Adler about her life and career. And uh, there's so much to talk about, it's hard to know where to start. But it seemed like it all began for you during the 1950s when the field of criminology and criminal justice was really uh, hardly recognized and women were conspicuously absent. How did you get involved? Uh, I was about seven years old when World War II broke out. And uh, I used to read the paper every night with my father. Well, he used to read it to me <laughs> most of the time. And I saw, um, I saw the paper was just full of war and ships and planes and soldiers. and. I asked my father, um, what is the paper going to look like after the war? And we continued to read, so I understood the war, and I kept saying, well, do they stop making papers after the, war, after the war? And then I realized after the war, no, they don't. But the papers were then filled with crime problems, crime, all, all sorts of, of criminal activity. And it was my first realization that uh, crime was a major problem in our society. And so uh, it was only a few years after that that I was a freshman and, of course, uh, started with my course. And I saw an elective, criminology, and I thought, well, how about that? Why don't I take criminology? Actually, I took criminology, and it was right here on this campus. And it was Dr. Otto Pollack who taught that course. I became fascinated with criminology, and uh, just as soon as I could get back to graduate school, also here at the University of Pennsylvania, um, I started my studies um, in criminology. And uh, at the time, um, we were uh, we had a, we got the degree in sociology, and spent seven more years in criminology and social sociology here, and. Uh, that's how I became interested, and that's what I did about it. Well, while you were pursuing your master's and PhD work here, you uh, had a lot of teaching and research experiences, everything from statistics to uh, drug addiction to sentence disparity to the death penalty. Uh, in fact, your first publication, I believe, was in 1968 on jury de decision making. Mm -hmm. Are you surprised that these topics are still lightning rod topics now some tw 30 years later? Uh, no, because the problems still exist. Um, when, I, uh, when I wrote that piece, we were in the 60s, the turmoil of the 60s, the social fervor of the 60s. And uh, as a graduate student, we were reminded to look at the system, to, to look at disparity in sentencing, to, to, to look at what kinds of problems we were dealing with. Um, and I, I thought to myself, well, um, if a jury is supposed to be a jury of one's peers, um, and we know that juries typically are not draw, uh, made up of people's peers because they're taken from voter lists or, or, or telephone books or what have you, uh, does it really matter if a jury is not of the same for example, socioeconomic level as a defendant. And I did a study whereby I compared the um, uh, guilty, 50 guilty, I took 50 guilty defendants, and I compared them with 50 not guilty defendants. And I, um, I, was, I matched on all legal variables. And I looked only at extra legal variables, this one being socioeconomic level. And I found that indeed, when there was a high SES level for the defend for the jury, and a low SES level for the defendant, the verdict ten, the verdict was significantly guilty. But to my surprise, I found that if the jury, if the defendant was from a high socioeconomic level, and the jury a low socioeconomic level, the same thing occurred. Hmm. That it was the disparity. They tended to convict. So that it was the amount of disparity between 
the defendant and the juror that mattered. And the closer they got in socioeconomic level, the more they tended to acquit. That's so. very interesting, controlling for the legal variables. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Now, you finished your PhD in 1971 here at Penn yes. and took your first full-time uh, teaching position as an assistant professor of psychiatry at the Medical College of Pennsylvania. Now, how did that come about? Um, in, in those days, it was uh, right after the establishment of the um, Law Enforcement Assistance uh, Administration, and uh, there were uh, many federal grants being distributed at that time, and uh, they certainly covered the, the drug area. Um, there was a lot of federal, fun uh, federal funding for uh, drug projects. And um, a, a uh, money went to the medical school at that time, and um, it seemed very interesting to me because it was time to do field research, do empirical research, field research. It seemed very exciting, and I went there to direct a, uh, a, a project. Um, we were supposed to evaluate. This is early, very early on evaluation. It was kind of primitive, actually. Uh, we were supposed to evaluate the types of drug treatment that were being funded by the government um, and to come up with some suggestions. Well, we had an initial problem because we couldn't find the programs, even though they were federally funded. We had to... Um, we had to travel around. We, the, the first project was in the state of Pennsylvania. We actually had to go out to small towns, to places, storefronts in inner cities, to prisons, to hospitals. We had to find. There was no list. We had to find the programs. And then when we finally found them, we went to evaluate to see what are they doing. A couple places we never did find, but we knew there were, that funds were coming right. in. And it just, it, um, we, these were the early days of the methadone programs, and we saw the, 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 the tremendous problems in those days with methadone, with uh, people um, coming out of methadone centers and, and, and uh, literally spitting the, the, the methadone that was mixed in some kind of juice, selling it to someone, selling drugs outside of methadone maintenance centers. Um, we, we saw that the centers, the, uh, the treatment in jails for, for um, drug addicted persons that was uh, about non-existent, even though it was a gold program. Um, and we did get to see a couple successful programs. One of them was a religious program, Teen Challenge. Um, I don't think it was the religious part of it that was so successful. I think it was rather uh, that there were uh, a lot of male, male um, adults interested in a lot of young boys that they were very very helpful and uh, were busy in socializing these young men. So um, it was an interesting project, lasted a couple of years and uh, uh, very exciting beginnings of evaluation. Mm -hmm. Now out of the gate in the first three years after finishing uh, here at Penn, uh, you had 16 publications in three years. Uh, how are you able to be so productive so quickly? There's a lot of uh, aspiring scholars out there who certainly want to know. Well, there were just so many exciting topics. Uh, I, I um, well, I, I guess I could say a couple of things. One is that when we got in, when we became interested in the topic, we certainly could do a literature search was a whole lot shorter than what it takes today. Uh, when I when I started, and I can tell you later about it, when I started my research in, in uh, uh, female crime, I had only six books to look at. Um, so there, there was um, uh, there, there was certainly a, a manageable uh, uh, literature search that helped. And uh, it's always been my feeling to move on, um, get excited, and while I have my enthusiasm, do the research, get it written, and move on because. When something starts, to, when I begin to feel that I've had enough, I think the readers are feeling that even more. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Okay, in 1974, Rutgers University started a new school of criminal justice. And uh, you uh, took a position there 
uh, among when the school was founded as part of the founding faculty. Uh, how did you come to take that position at Rutgers? Now, Jay, they were very exciting days. Um, I can mention now you must remember how exciting they were because you were there as a student. It sure was. So it was, um, again, uh, after the uh, federal money and the uh, LEAA, pro, uh, LEAA mandated um, uh, more education in criminal justice. And um, there was school at, at SUNY um, at Albany. Uh, and then I believe we were probably the second school of criminal justice, graduate school of criminal justice. And at that time, we sat down in 1973 when Don Godfordson, who we both greatly mm -hmm. respect, when Don called and he said, um, he said, Frida, there's um, a new school. Uh, it's a school of criminal justice. And I thought, yeah, I've, I've heard of new school of criminal new schools of criminal justice. I'd come out of criminology and sociology. Yes, and. And um, uh, we talked about it, and I was getting really excited. And there I was, changing my work, changing my life, all enthusiastic again. And we, we sat down with um, the founding members. There was, there was Jim Finkenauer, David Twain, Richard Sparks, Gerhard Mueller. Of course, Don was the dean, and myself. And it was, um, it was a challenge. First thing we said is, what do we teach in the School of Criminal Justice? Second thing we said, where do we where do we find the students? And uh, it was it was great to be in on the, the ground level of um, of a discipline that has grown so quickly and um, uh, is uh, uh, has advanced so far. Yeah, it really is amazing how far it's come in, in a short period of time. Yes. Well, in 1975, an event took place that certainly made Frida Adler a household name in criminology circles, and that was the publication of your book, Sisters in Crime, by McGraw-Hill. Uh, what, uh, what would you say is the central thesis of the book, and did you have any idea it would be as successful as it was? Um, well, that's a very good question. I, um, I wrote Sisters in Crime, and, and as I said, mentioned before, there were only six books written before, starting with Lombroso in 1898, and then W.I. Thomas, and then uh, Otto Pollock, of oh, the Glucks, and then Otto Pollock, and then a couple of women in prison. And uh, I had very small literature search, and then I, I, um, I had written my dissertation on a female criminal in Philadelphia. And I said to myself, well, here's an area that really is unchartered, and, and um, it, it was a challenge. But actually, um, there was a little serendipity involved. I, during the course of my drug studies, we interviewed the clients of the drug programs. And interviewing the uh, young women, I asked them, had, how do you support your habit? Because I expected that they would give me the, 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 the female criminal role, uh, shoplifting mm -hmm. or prostitution. Um, I just began to hear more uh, burglary, uh, selling stolen goods. Uh, I, I heard a story, uh, I guess, one that I'll never forget, uh, of a woman by the name of Marge. I, I asked her, and she said, well, she had, um, she did start out, um, she was a prostitute, but she was Catholic, and so she thought that that was not a good, illegal um, job. So she became a bank robber. Oh. And it was a, I'll never forget her. Uh, but I, you see the, the sequence. Mm -hmm. I, I saw women who were becoming involved in behaviors that I didn't expect uh, they were involved in. Uh, and then I, um, I, it was also a time when we were reading quite a bit about the, the, from the six, from 67, 68 on into the 70s about women involved in um, terrorist activities, uh, the 
Bader Meinhof gang, half women. Uh, the uh, the queen of the Japanese Red Army, a woman. Um, Lil Kalad was very involved. It was in it was a um, in in a more of a of a liberation organization, but uh, still a, a Muslim woman involved. Um, and I. I began seeing more young women involved as uh, gang members. Mm -hmm. I looked at the statistics in 1972 and I, I saw that women had been 4% of the arrest statistic, uh, the arrest statistic in um, 1960 and by the time I looked in 72 they were up to 18% of arrests. And that uh, there were um, Oh, prostitutes had formed the union called Coyote, and they were they were much more assertive. There were um, um, several um, uh, women, uh, s uh, several uh, all-girl gangs. Not many, not many, but in the large cities, all-girl gangs were developing, uh, not auxiliaries. And then I thought, well, now it's my time. It's a good topic, something I can really get involved in. And I wrote Sisters in Crime. Jay, I had no idea, no idea um, that there would be such a reaction to the book. I, I thought the book was uh, common sense, and it was not really a theory. It was a hy an hypothesis, and that it it wasn't. I mean, it was an, It was okay. I was happy with it at the end, but I think that it became such a popular book because of the political times. I think that this, this is a book, a scientific book, that would have been on the shelf, like so many scientific books, and that would have been it. But given that there was, it was a time of, women, of women's liberation, of political fervor, of, of uh, equal opportunity for women, um, this book became very politicized. It became a book that was a threat to uh, to the women's liberation movement. Uh, the thesis of, of the book, the hypothesis of the book, is simple. It simply says that as women's illegitimate role in society changes, so too will her illegitimate role. Why? Well, you can talk about opportunity theory, you can talk about less social control. You can talk about more strain. You, you, you could fill in the intervening variables anyway, any way you want. But for all of these reasons, that when we saw women changing their position in the illegitimate, on the illegitimate ladder, for uh, the shoplifter was, uh, the shopper was the shoplifter. Now you have women in fidu with fiduciary capacity. They can embezzle. There were no women in Watergate. There were no women working in those jobs. So that it seemed to me that crime would change as roles changed and that there wasn't anything particularly dramatic about that statement. But it triggered, it triggered a reaction and that was don't say anything about female crime changing as females are just coming out of the old-fashioned roles. Right. And as a scientist, that wasn't my problem. I had, um, I, it, it created, as you know, and we've talked about, um, uh, it, it, I, um, uh, the media, for example. Let's take media first, the, um, to see the, the, the kind of sensationalized version. Um, at the time, I, I, uh, I was trying to defend my, myself uh, from writing the scientific book and, and to say that I wrote it because I think we should gear up the system if there are problems that, and there are women in the system, we should know about it. And also, I had a thesis. So what happened was uh, I, I started a, a, a run of talk shows. I started my first talk show was with uh, Barbara Walters and then we had a very interesting conversation because I guess because it was new and because it might have been considered a threat. Uh, and then I, I was 
I, I was doing, I did two years of talk shows, uh, always saying, my subject is not entertainment. My subject is very serious. In fact, at, at a given moment at the commercial, I asked to leave one of the, sh the talk shows because there were entertainers and uh, on the same program. My subject is not funny. So um, I, I did those, and then the, 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 uh, the, the newspapers and the, the magazines uh, took it on. I know that, that there were three-inch headlines in the L.A. Times, you know, that revert back to Ed Davis, who was commissioner, saying, women's lib causes crime. You know, ask Frida Adler. Right. And then I found this in also, then, then Playboy and, and, and Viva, another magazine, and, and uh, besides treatment in, in respectable magazines, and people, it was all uh, considered so so sensational and so dramatic. It wasn't. It, it, it absolutely wasn't. But when, this, that was okay. I could see the public image. If you talk about women and guns and sex, it's going to be picked up by the media. Then you try to calm that. But then the scientific community, they were right behind. Uh, certainly the radical feminist end of it saying, you're going to destroy the advancement of women. Well, it's, it's didn't happen. Didn't happen. And, and, and so we went, and, 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 the, and the scientific community saying it didn't exist. Now, hundreds of thousands of dollars went into uh, federally funded research projects uh, studying my thesis, which wasn't a thesis. Um, and uh, things calmed down later by, I, I must say, uh, by, uh, by the 1980s, of course, society be became much more conservative. And, uh, and uh, we, female crime had become just a study in itself, an important study. Mm -hmm. Well, since that time, uh, Sisters in Crime is and has remained one of the most often cited books in the field, and uh, gender has become uh, the focus of the establishment of women's institutes, uh, books, courses on women's studies, this sort of thing. Uh, what do you make of, of these developments? Well, if I had any small part in it, um, I, um, I feel really good about it. I, I know I know that when I joined the American Society of Criminology back in the mid-1960s, there were no women. And uh, toward the end of the 60s, there were a few of us. Uh, I'm happy to say today that one-third of the membership of the American Society of Criminology uh, is female. And there are many, many more women coming into the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences all of the time now. And membership of women is growing there too. Um, I, I see um, now we have about half of our graduate students are female. Um, women are entering a field that they had not been in before and um, I, I'm very pleased if I had anything to do with it. Uh, since, since that work you were asked to contribute a large number of, of pieces on uh, female criminality in various manifestations. Uh, one of the most interesting, it seems, was, was your report to the United Nations on female criminality around the world. How did that come about? Um, that came about because Sisters in Crime came out in, in 1975, and that was the uh, International Year of the Woman, National Women's Year. Um, and they asked me to write a report on the status of uh, female criminality uh, in the world which was difficult to do because I had very little information. And then it was also the year of the um, United Nations uh, Congress on uh, Crime Prevention and the Treatment of Offenders. Mm -hmm. it was, that one was held in, uh, in Geneva. And they also asked me for a report on the status of criminality. Now most of my report, um, most of my report said we really don't know and we should know. And uh, the one thing we knew was that in, um, especially in the um, uh, developed world that we were seeing more women coming into the criminal justice uh, uh, into the system and um, 
since that time, we, uh, we have asked about the breakdown by gender um, when countries report their statistics, so that it was, it was the beginning of both developed and developing countries thinking about women coming into the criminal justice mm -hmm. system. As the 1970s went on, uh, in 1979, you were promoted to the rank of full professor at Rutgers. You also edited the book with Rita Simon, The Criminology of Deviant Women. And in the early 80s, 81, I believe, you wrote the, the book on the incidence of female criminality uh, around, uh, around the world, in the contemporary world. Mm -hmm. um, these, these publications seem to feed off one another and your views seem to expand from, you know, the international side to the, I mean, from the national side to the international side in dramatic, in dramatic uh, uh, fashion. Well, I had a lot of help because between the time that I wrote Sisters in Crime and the publication of these books, um, many, many young scholars were, were joining into the field. So I, I had many people who were contributors to, mm -hmm. to readers. There was general excitement. Mm -hmm. And I also had people in different countries. And we, 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 we formed a group. And, and so when in, the, in 1975, I, I would, had very little material. By 1980, 1982, I had quite a bit of material. And it, 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 it was actually a, a discipline within a discipline. So I had a lot to work from. Yeah, that, that really was the first generation of research in the area yes. where significant amounts of data were gathered. Yes. Now, in 1983, one of my favorite Frieda Adler books was published, Nations Not Obsessed with Crime. What was the theme of that book? Oh, that's, um, that was also, uh, I think, my most interesting project. If I had to think of my most interesting project, you just reminded me of that how excited I was to do it. Um, I was asked by the United Nations to um, find the 10 countries in the world with the lowest crime rates and to find a common denominator. Why did those 10 countries have lower crime rates than the, than the other countries of the world? We had our data from the um, United Nations World Crime Surveys and I, was supposed to take two countries, one from each of the five cultural regions of the UN, and I was supposed to do a study uh, looking for what those countries had in common, common denominator for, for low criminality. Uh, I started it by um, looking at 48 different United Nations data sets and by uh, using a computer and we were going to do it this very simply and have a nice regression equation, it would be easy, but it didn't work because our, we did, our data were, were simply not good enough. So it ended up as a three-year project, uh, qualitative study. Um, I had the, um, the opportunity, rare opportunity, to live and work in these countries to uh, not only to work with the experts um, at the UN and within the countries, but also to listen to the people, to spend time out with the Bedouins in the Saudi Arabian desert, uh, to spend time with groups living in the mountains in Peru, to, 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 to get involved. It was, um, uh, I, I that the countries, and I, I think it, it's, it was interesting to me because the countries that had the lowest crime rates were so very, so very different. Saudi Arabia and Algeria for um, uh, the Islamic countries, and then we had uh, the Republic of Ireland and Switzerland, mm -hmm. and we had Costa Rica and Peru, we had Japan and Nepal, and for the then socialist bloc, we had uh, uh, Bulgaria and the German Demo the former uh, German Democratic Republic. And if you think of those 10 countries, they're rich, poor, there are many different kinds of governments, parliamentary uh, monarchies. Um, they're agrarian and they're highly industrialized. So that what we knew about causes of crime um, 
you know, it didn't it didn't somehow mesh with um, it didn't mesh with what we found ten different countries so different. What is it that they shared? Um, and in the end, you know, I can't go through the whole thing, but in the end, we found that all ten countries had a very strong informal social control mechanism working. By informal social control, I mean in some it was religion, in some it was commune, in the commune, in some it was a um, it was the uh, the the factory or the or the uh, family, but it could be a surrogate family. For example, the Japanese factory system that take that has someone that that, that takes care of the family, mm -hmm. and you actually are buried in the graveyard of a particular uh, factory, and your whole life is spent at the factory. It's a community. If you do something wrong, you you are. Uh, as Braithwaite would say, there's reintegrative shaming. <laughs> uh, you're brought right back mm -hmm. into the community. So these countries shared an informal social control, a, uh, a very strong informal social control mechanism that kept the crime rates very low. No. And you invented a term to summarize that called cinnamy. Well, after doing the study, um, I I wanted to um, to write a piece after the empirical research. I wanted to write a piece on theory and what I saw, um, what how I believed we could um, use the term integrate, but what, how we could get a macro perspective, macro sociological perspective, by working with the theoretical schools that we all know so well and. Um, we, we went from strain in the beginning of, of a political social unit uh, that was just beginning to develop, would be strained by the new factory system. There would be loss of social mm -hmm. control as, the, you, as, as social development continued. Then there would be the break off into deviant cultures. Then there would be the formation of subculture as we continue to develop and modernize. And I knew that enemy would be at one end of this continuum, but there wasn't a word for the other end of the continuum. So I thought, well, an uh, anomie is the Greek ah, uh, without, and nomos, uh, which is uh, laws or, or norms. So I simply uh, changed the ah to syn, which in Greek is with, and came up with synomy, or synomy, which is society with norms, with values. Yeah, fascinating. Well, as you proceeded on, in 1984, you were promoted to the rank of Professor Two at, at Rutgers, which uh, is the, the highest rank of a professor at Rutgers, indicating that you had achieved both national and international recognition in the field. Uh, another indicator of your recognition by your recognition level by the mid-'80s was the fact that uh, Sisters in Crime was reissued uh, ten years after its original publication. So over a, a decade of 10 years, sometimes I think about the number of books that are still in print uh, nowadays after 10 years, and it's very few. Uh, were you surprised by the fact that the book, after, after uh, its first decade, had so much interest, uh, it, it was republished all over again? Um, I think that, that it, it was republished because people uh, who were, because there was a proliferation of courses in female crime and in um, across the country in departments of criminology and criminal justice. And I, I think that, that um, they use Sisters in Crime as this is what we thought in 1975, and then this is somehow how it changed or did, how our attitudes have changed or didn't change. And this is the scientific work that has come from that point on, and these are the studies that came out of Sisters in Crime. So um, they, of course, pleased me, and I hope it was helpful to the scholars that came after me in that field. And also in uh, 1985, you entered almost an entirely new area of uh, criminology when you co-authored with Gerhard Mueller the book Outlaws of the Ocean. Now, how did that book come about? Um, that, 
it's, it's a little anecdotal, but uh, I can tell you, um, uh, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Gerhard and I married in, uh, in 1976. Actually, you were a student, and I think that the, the, the students knew before anyone else. That, yeah, the that, faculty didn't know, but the students knew. <laughs> the fact, yes, yeah, I, I, um, I, had, uh, I had met him when I was a student, and he was president of the American Society of Criminology, and uh, I heard him give a speech, and afterward I went to tell him that I didn't agree with some of his basic assumptions, and I never saw him again until years later, you know, when we were both working in the drug field. And uh, of course, then I met him again, as a faculty member, that's a little aside. Um, and, but uh, the anecdote, and I had to say this before, we, uh, we had a little boat at the time, and uh, one night we were sleeping on the boat, and uh, I said to Garrett, I said, uh, I think we're drifting. And uh, we, we checked. And there we were, going into Long Island Sound. We had been cut. Somebody had obviously wanted to steal our boat. They had cut us loose, taken off the, the ropes. And uh, there we were. And, and we, we said, here we are, criminologists. We're floating down the sound. Somebody's trying to steal our boat. And nobody ever talks about crime on the water. And what a topic. So. And then we said, well, three quarters of the earth is covered by water. And we're talking about crime on one, on one fourth of the, of the earth's surface. Mm -hmm. So we got extremely, we got very involved. And uh, it was exciting writing because it, I, I was surprised at what I found about modern day piracy, about the drug smuggle, about the alien smuggle, about um, about major um, frauds, I mean, carloads of, 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 uh, of um, uh, goods that are supposed to get to developing countries never get there, about ships being sunk um, ju just to get the, their, the insurance. And uh, we started the experience by going out with the, with the United States Coast Guard into the drug waters. They took us on board for one of the runs. Mm -hmm. We actually lived with them. Uh, our only, uh, the only thing, our only arrangement was that uh, whenever there was a boarding of a suspect vessel, and that was all day and all night, that we had to be on the bridge, even if it meant getting out of bed. Oh dear. Yeah. So we were a part of it, and we learned what it was like. It was, and is war out there and we saw that many of the drug boats were better equipped and uh, moved faster than uh, the, the boats that, that were so, so to speak there to search and, and patrol. Uh, um, that was an exciting and we have continued um, since that time to look at three quarters, the crime on three quarters of the earth. Yeah and uh, once again you were ahead of the curve now with the international smuggling uh, 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 being dramatic now, given the ease of border crossings now uh, yes. than ever before. Now, in 1989, you and Bill Laffer uh, started a, a series of annual edited volumes called Advances in Criminological Theory, mm -hmm. which has now been going on and is continuing now in, into its eighth year. Uh, what was what was the motivation behind that series? Well, there were very few journals uh, accepting theoretical pieces uh, for many years. You know, you know, criminology is a, an infant discipline. Uh, we don't have all that many journals. Well, now we have quite a few. But um, uh, in, in the beginning, we didn't have very many journals. And it was easier to publish uh, empirical pieces. And young professors had to publish. They had. To and if something was well done, it was an empirical piece and it had conclusions, it had a good chance if it, if it uh, advanced our knowledge of getting it uh, to a journal. But a theoretical piece, uh, there, 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 were pr there was practically no outlet. And uh, I, uh, I had started thinking about this years ago. And then I went 
to Irving Horowitz, Transaction Press, and I said to him, um, I'm thinking about having an, an annual, some outlet for people's thoughts, thinking, and it's going to be criminological theory. And he looked at me and he said, is there criminological theory? <laughs> In his own wonderful way. And I said, give me two volumes. And uh, he took a chance. He gave me two volumes. Uh, and since that time, we have had, um, we're on our eighth volume, as you know, and, and it's very exciting. It's uh, highly peer-reviewed. Um, it's, uh, uh, we work out, uh, we, we bring on guest editors. We've done developmental criminality, rational choice and routine activities. Um, the next volume will be the criminology of the criminal law. Uh, we, and we are uh, up to the year 2000 with volume 10. Wow. So we, it's very exciting. It is. It is exciting. And especially, uh, certainly there's a need for theory in the field. Arguably, it's easier to publish a piece with the weakest of data sets than it is to publish a good idea. And it's, it is kind of backwards, but uh, yeah, that seems to be the way that... It's also exciting because we, we have a section for dialogue, and so people can talk to each other in the annual. Oh, that's fabulous. And that's, I remember uh, Gil Geis answered Don Cressy, and he answered him in a comment of about 50 pages. <laughs> <laughs> that would be Gil Geis. Well, in, in, in the 1990s, you certainly ha haven't slowed down. In fact, you've taken on one of the most daunting tasks of all. Together with uh, Garrett Mueller and Bill Laufer, you wrote a major introductory textbook for McGraw-Hill in 91 titled Criminology. What was your motivation for taking on such a huge task? Well, i have been teaching since 1965 and Gerhard for many more years. And... Uh, Bill Laffer was excited about it as a younger member of the team. And uh, I know for Gerhard and myself, we, um, we, we wanted, we felt that, that we had a perspective after all these years and that, that we wanted our students to have, well, whatever you think of the book, <laughs> but that we had been through enough, we had seen enough. We had watched the development mm -hmm. of many different dif disciplines within the discipline. And we wanted, we wanted to write. We wanted to show how criminology started, where it was going, where, what the future looked like. We, we, we just felt that it was something we wanted to, to give after all those years to the next generation. Well, apparently uh, it's worked. You now have uh, new additions uh, you know, into your third edition already. And uh, following that book in 91, the first edition, you followed in 94, I believe it was, with another major intro book on criminal justice. And it was the same thing with criminal justice. Um, after all, the, the, the system's approach to criminal justice came about in, in 67 and 68 with, a, with LEAA. Mm -hmm. That's, that was that first, I'm sure by now, that all of you know so well, that first chart from how we are a system, and that's when we became a system. And having been a part of all that, and seeing that criminal justice system that we didn't have, seeing it develop, and seeing the, the proliferation of research, mm -hmm. and where it fit, and how it fit, and how it made sense, and where there were loopholes, what we needed to do, uh, we, we, we felt that we had something to say in the text. Now, in the midst of all this, you've done extensive traveling. You've made presentations all over the U.S. and around the world. By my count, you've made presentations in at least 30 different countries. What do you come away with after all that exposure to what's going on nationally and internationally? Uh, I, I come away feeling that um, we can learn a lot from other countries and perhaps they can learn something from us, although we have such a high crime rate that uh, um, sometimes we're learning more from other countries than we're giving, but, but still we are, we are indeed. Um, uh, I found that I was able to share the um, research results uh, from the United States with people in other countries, 
and I found out that I learned a lot that, that for example, um, uh, mediation in China, volunteers and probation in Japan. I learned so much about, um, uh, about uh, what works. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would always look what works and how does it work. And we can, we can bring these, we can, sometimes we can't really transplant exactly something's working at another place, but we can transplant it the way it's useful for us in the United States. And we can also give. And that's, that's what I came away with, sharing of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think one important contribution of your work is that it's really only been in the last 20 years, and a lot of it due to your work, that the United States has come to realize that the best answers might not be within our own borders here. Some of the best answers are... Yes. Um, uh, crime is, is globalized. And we have to realize, certainly have to realize, that what's happening in downtown Philadelphia, where we happen to be, or, or downtown in a Midwestern town, mm -hmm. uh, is very much related to crime in different parts of the world, whether it's uh, money laundering or drug smuggling or alien smuggling or, 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 or terrorist activities. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's movement, very fast movement around the world now, especially the internet, those problems. And um, so this, this whole idea of the, the global approach to crime uh, has, has got to take precedence. Now, your status in the field was confirmed in 1994-95 when you were elected and served as president of the American Society of Criminology, which is the oldest professional organization of criminologists. What did you enjoy most as president of ASC? Um, well, I guess you can tell from the, the title was Crime and Justice, National and International. I very much uh, wanted by, by, by that time for criminologists and and criminal justicians to be a part of social policy, to make social policy. And I enjoyed very, uh, I enjoyed very much the fact that, um, uh, not uh, more than enjoyed, I, I, um, I felt a responsibility um, toward Attorney General Janet Reno when uh, she came to our meeting in Miami and asked for input from scientists. And it was during my presidency that I, uh, I was um, uh, able to form task forces because I had so many um, researchers volunteering their time to give input uh, for policymakers. And the Attorney General was extremely appreciative. And indeed, um, Jeremy Travis, the director of the National Institute of Justice, was, um, um, uh, was extremely excited about the input of the scientists. This had nothing, of course, to do as a, with ASC as a body, but it was just the individuals in ASC who were so willing to give up their time uh, to, uh, to inform policy. And I wanted that meeting to, uh, uh, I wanted that meeting to demonstrate how the researchers could work with the policymakers to, so, uh, together. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted, as you see, the other theme, the international. We had, um, we had about 60 countries represented. So that I, I wanted to bring the researchers from around the world together, open it up so that we could have, we could look at other policymakers, what other researchers were doing toward policy. So we had the, the national and international. That's what was so exciting about the presidency. And, and your influence in the field continues today. I conducted a LexisNexis search for this interview and found that you have, were cited just in the past two years and just in news publications, the New York Times and other, and other periodicals, you were cited f more than 50 times. No, I didn't know. Now, how do you, how do you account for your work being so newsworthy? Um, perhaps, it's it, perhaps it's because um, I... I, I, I typically study policies that uh, I study. I, I do research projects that have policy implications. That might be an, a, an answer. Whether it's 
uh, females coming into the system, or drug addiction, um, or or current day piracy, or alien smuggling, um, uh, or or low crime. There there are definitely policy implications, and so I guess uh, I guess it's the policy end of it that uh, brings the newspapers to ask mm -hmm. about the research. Well, it's been more than 25 years now si since you earned your Ph.D. Uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. You have the top faculty position at one of the best universities in the country, and uh, you have almost 100 total publications. Uh, what's left for Frida Adler to accomplish? Well, we're getting towards um, the end of the interview, and I can tell you, I can tell you, that's a very easy question. Um, What's left is um, uh, teaching and mentoring. Uh, you, Jay, I can be personal because we're towards the end, uh, received the first PhD given out in the Graduate School of Criminal Justice at Rutgers University. You went on to become a full professor, to become president of the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences, to be a strong researcher and to uh, inform policymakers with your books and your articles. Uh, I, uh, when I follow your career, and I follow the careers of a number of my other students, uh, that's exciting and that makes me want to go on and I see people in sitting in my classes and could be another J. Owens, <laughs> could be well, thank another you. William nice Laffer, of you to say. could be, and it's, um, and, I, and I, I could go on. Uh, my students have been doing exciting work. They are deans and chairs and, and writing great books. Um, what's left? I want to I st stay in that classroom. I hope I can contribute something toward making uh, the, 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 the incoming criminal justice persons excited about the discipline, excited enough to go on and, and, and become special people in the field. That's what I want to do. And here we are at the end of the 20th century. Uh, where do you see uh, criminology and criminal justice going in the 21st century? Um, I mentioned before the uh, Global Village. I think that uh, we will definitely be uh, much more concerned with um, transnational crime, whether it's a money laundering or, or drug smuggling or, or piracy or major fraud. Yeah. Um, there are a list of about 18 transnational crimes now. Uh, the UN will be concentrating on transnational crimes in their new centers. And I think that we will have to work together, scientists around the world, will, by the nature of the crimes, we will have to work together, we will have to do our research together, we will have to share our experiences. Uh, so we are definitely headed toward um, comparative uh, criminology, uh, much more research in comparative criminology. I think we are also um, becoming much more uh, policy oriented. I think that the um, the criminal justice and justicians and, and criminologists will be much more a part of the uh, of policy making in the future than we have been in the past. Um, we can inform. We can give. Uh, we will never enter into uh, uh, decisions of, of of right or wrong, but we will um, we will be there to evaluate. Does community policing work? Does three strikes work? Does uh, uh, boot camp work? We will be there to evaluate and to inform. And I think that also in the future, we will see a shift away from the punitiveness that has come into our criminal justice system and into society in general. And I think that there will be a shift back to looking for uh, crime problem solving in the area of prevention 
especially prevention um, in the preschool years um, and, and going up from there. Um, I think that there will be a turn and I think that it is up to the scholars to demonstrate that prevention in early years, although costly and the results come about a long time later, that, um, that those are the important kinds of results that, that we hope, that that's what we hope to find, we think we'll find, and uh, we need to put a lot more money and time into, um, uh, into the generation that is just being born mm -hmm. and preventing at that end. Thank you, Frida Adler, for sharing at least some highlights of your life and career. Thank you very much for watching.